you missed the Nobel Prize. And whereas last year when we did the Nobel Prize and I had to sit there and say, I have no idea what this was about. On this occasion, I knew. And uh, so I had no one to tell. Well, it's gone to uh, Peter Higgs and Francois Anglais for some wonderful work that they did back in the 60s, uh, which has become known as the, the Higgs mechanism, the, the, the way in which the fundamental particles in nature acquire a mass. Three different groups independently were all working on the same physics. They all, on the same kind of time scale, came up with the same, essentially the same result, um, and yet they didn't all get the prize. I did watch it, and in fact it was uh, with, a, with a mixture of happiness, and uh, to be honest, I was quite sad. <laughs> because it, uh, well, first of all, one of the people that uh, should have got it sadly died last year, Brout, who worked with Anglais, um, so he couldn't get it. And, but then there's a, there were three more who did the, the work together, and one of them was uh, my friend uh, that I've collaborated with, Tom Kibble, and um, I feel he should have got it. You know, you have to draw a line somewhere, it's the, the way it is, and at the moment I think the Nobel Prize's rule is that three is the maximum number that you can actually award it to, um, which is, you know, it's a completely arbitrary number, it could be six, it could be ten, um, and so, you know, it's just, just the rule that they have. They have a little write-up of, you know, why did they give the prize, and I looked at it and I thought, well, it's exactly what they did, Tom and his collaborators did, and it seems that they just missed out because of a, a rule and it, it doesn't even seem to be a very in writing it's just a, a rule that they've developed which is that you don't give it to more than three people but Higgs and Anglais fully deserve it it's a fantastic uh, piece of theoretical work back in the 60s and uh, all credit to them. I suppose the complication in this on this occasion was that um, the th there wasn't a simple third person there were three other people that I mean, the story of the, the papers is remarkable. We're talking back in the 1960s, 64, in the summer of 1964, three groups working basically on the same topic, and uh, they all wrote papers within a few months of each other. I think Anglais might have been the first, and then Higgs came kind of hot on the heels of that. And there was definitely then a delay between that and Tom's paper coming out. And in fact, Tom knew about the papers of Higgs and Anglaire and Brout, but they were doing their work independently, and they were on, you know, they were basically finishing their work on the, on the equivalent mechanism. In those days, they didn't have the archive. You couldn't simply submit your paper to the archive and have it read within the, by the next day. You you sent it out as a preprint to those people that you thought would be interested. So Brout and, and Anglaire and Higgs, of course, sent their paper to Tom but it got stuck in a London sorting office because there was a postal strike, so for at least two weeks it got stuck there. And then Tom, when they eventually delivered all the mail to Imperial College, Tom collected the papers both together on that day, and I presume he read through them, and then they, because they actually referenced some of this, their work in, in their own paper, Tom's own paper. So I think the issue is that um, probably that it, it wasn't a single authored third paper, it was three authors, and so if you've decided there a rule that says there's only going to be three people getting it, you can't, how do you then give it to three more? Once I realised that he hadn't got it, I just texted him and said, um, I'm very sorry to hear you didn't get it, I think you deserved it. And he replied. <laughs> he replied almost immediately. And he just said, thanks very much. <laughs> He's such a modest guy. He didn't say, I know those people. <laughs> Of equal magnitude to this fantastic theoretical work, easily of equal magnitude, must have been the experimental work to actually get the Higgs. I mean, it's, it's a tour de force, right? And you've got the you've got the accelerator people who actually run the LHC and get the beams so that they're sufficiently high energy and sufficiently stable that you can make use of them. Then you've got these two huge groups working in CMS and in Atlas. Each have got thousands of people in the collaboration. I know, I'm not suggesting all the thousands of them made a big contribution to the Higgs discovery, but I'm sure hundreds did. And what do you do? I mean, without, without the discovery of these decay channels and without the, the, the painstaking effort that went into actually showing that, they, they, that, that these primary decays were likely to, due to a Higgs, we, we wouldn't have this discovery. And yet, you, you can't. It doesn't it seem to me you can even simply give it to the spokesperson of these experiments because the experiments are so long running that they've been through a number of spokespeople. 
So which, which spokesperson do you give it to? Do you give it to the spokesperson that was in charge you know, when the discovery was made? Do you give it to the spokespeople who sort of came up with the idea of the experiment? Somehow I think you might have to contemplate giving it to CERN. Yeah, I, th I mean, they already do that. With the Peace Prize, they do that, right? They're actually, it's gone to the Red Cross and things like that from time to time. So actually, it does go to, that one does, does go to organisations. And so there's a reasonable argument that says, well, why don't we do the same thing for science? Some big prizes are, are doing that. I mean, I think WMAP, the, the big microwave, cosmic microwave background experiment, doesn't have as many people on it as CERN, but they got, um, was it the Gruber Prize? That, they, they, they got a big prize anyway that was shared amongst the the members of the group, it went to the group. I think it will be a mistake because actually, at some level, you know, it, the, the, the Nobel Prize, it's like a, a man of the match award. It's not, you know, you, you, no one really thinks when you, somebody gets the man of the match award in some sporting event that they were the only person who contributed to the team. It's just a way, in some way, of, of personalising and highlighting the performance of the team by picking on one person. And in that sense, the Nobel Prize is just doing the same thing. It's just putting a personal face on a piece of science, which makes it, you know, more more of general interest. It makes it easier to tell the story. Um, but but I don't think anyone really thinks that Higgs was the only person responsible for the Higgs boson just because his name's associated with it, and he's one of the people who got the Nobel Prize. No, I, I can see the point and the ideal nature of it going to an individual. You'd like to think of an individual has done this and and. But the reality is some of this work really is multi, you know, multi-person involvement. It, you can't, I don't think you can pin it down to one person, and yet it's so important. The, these big high energy physics projects do need that kind of level of input in order to be able to reach the, the, the accuracy and the statistical significance that they need to to be able to claim a result. I mean, if you did start giving out Nobel Prizes to organisations, there is this real danger, you know, you get this nice shiny thing and, and you know, so supposing it had gone to CERN, they get this nice shiny award and they put it on a shelf somewhere and it would end up being just, you know, another corporate excellence award. And, and really no one cares about corporate excellence awards. They want to know about human interest stories, they want to know about exciting pieces of science and just saying some large organisation succeeded in this. You know, they did and that's part of the story but it really shouldn't be the headline item because that's not going to infuse anyone about science. Could they give it to the others next year? Oh, to the other three? No, I don't think so. No, because the thing that they've given it for is what they did. <laughs> they all did very similar things. And I, I mean, maybe I'm not reading it, the wording, subtly enough. Perhaps there's some very subtle um, use of the language in there, which means you could actually drop off those three and just use the other two papers. I, I, but I don't think so. I, so I don't think they can give it that again. You know, as scientists, we have a responsibility not only to discover stuff, but to tell the world what it is we've discovered. And the Nobel Prize is a very effective mechanism for getting some of those stories out. And we need to use the most appropriate mechanism for getting those stories out. And giving out corporate excellence awards is not the right way to get that story out. Telling a story about an individual discovering something, their contribution to a particular subject, and putting it in the context then, having established them, of saying that actually there was this, all this other stuff going on is the right thing to do and then people get this picture of actually that there is this very large organisation and lots of work's gone in. But the way they were led into that story was through what, one or two individuals. Where the individual was part of a team, every time I've ever seen one of these Nobel Prize winners talk about their work, they were always the first to give the, the credit to everybody else. And so they really are just then at that point the spokesman for the science that they've done or spokeswoman for the science that they've done and actually are putting that story out there to the world. And so the fact, you know, it has to be, I think it has to be an individual doing it because if you just gave it to an organisation, then, you know, one of their PR department will be the person who come up before the press. And that doesn't create the same kind of inspiration of having the, you know, sometimes slightly eccentric but usually quite interesting scientist being the person who stands up and does it. And the other, you know, the other side to this is a, a friend and colleague of mine, Brian Schmidt, who won it in astronomy a few years ago, is now an amazingly effective advocate for science in Australia. Um, and so having won that Nobel Prize, he is now in a position to actually influence politicians to get out there to get the science message across to a much wider market than you would ever do if you were, weren't giving it to some individual and putting, you know, creating a figurehead in that sense. And you're right, it's kind of arbitrary who gets to be the figurehead, but nonetheless, I think it's important that we do have those figureheads. What if you were that fourth person? <laughs> then I'm probably telling you a slightly different story now.